can uh, we can begin this uh, session of the uh, mini symposium uh, uh, from Enoviti International. Uh, Enoviti International, as you know, is a network with 67, in fact, uh, partners. So it is a, a academic partner, research uh, center partner, and uh, industry partner. Uh, they are working, all of them, as you know, on uh, uh, formation, uh, but also research project, and including also uh, uh, transfer or uh, um, communication um, and scientific communication. That's the reason that you have this uh, mini symposium uh, today. Um, as you know, uh, Enoviti International is doing uh, two times in the year, normally, some uh, uh, symposium. So there is two mini symposium, one by semester, approximately, uh, each year. Uh, and there is also what we call sprint meetings that are shorter meetings for one hour, uh, including um, a topic that is developed generally by uh, um, industry partners that are focused on a, on a real uh, specific apply uh, thematic generally. So there will be also next one um, for the, the next week uh, of, of the spring meeting. I think it's the 24th of November. Uh, and so uh, we are happy to, to have this, uh, this topic uh, on, the, on the mock trouble, uh, because uh, of course, uh, now is something that is really uh, very important all around the, the world for all uh, uh, countries uh, doing wine. Actually, we, we can see that uh, this trouble has uh, been extended uh, now for, uh, for some years. Uh, so it's very important to 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 talk about it, to know uh, issue about it, and uh, how we can solve this trouble. Um, a last point, maybe, and then I will let the word to to Mark. That is uh, that was uh, doing a great job uh, to to manage uh, this mini symposium, and I want to thanks Mark and all the colleagues from Australia to be here for the. Uh, for the event. Uh, we know that it's late for you. So thank you so much to be with us and to share your experience uh, uh, with all of us. Uh, and then I would like also to, to tell uh, to all the assistants that we should have our um, uh, general symposium uh, and general assembly in uh, May uh, 2023, normally in Japan. It should be in Kyoto, but also in uh, in Yamanashi. Uh, in Kyoto, we will have a, a symposium on wine and health, and in Yamanashi should be a, a symposium uh, more devoted to viticulture, enology, uh, globally. So thank you to all of you, to all the speakers, all the partners to be there for the for this mini symposium. And I let the work to, to Mark to introduce and manage the, the session. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much, Pierre-Louis, and I really appreciate it. Uh, so welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the mini symposium this afternoon, uh, this evening, wherever, wherever you are in the world, uh, around smoke tank, fires, wine and vine, uh, looking at management and problem solving. Uh, for those that don't know, my name is Mark Christick. I'm the managing director here at the Australian Wine Research Institute in Adelaide, Australia. So, uh, and I guess uh, Pierre-Louis is asking me to come in and help um, coordinate this session just because of the background that I've had over many years in and around this area, doing a lot of research as well. Um, I think we've got a great lineup of presenters and we'll get into those pretty soon just after I give a, a brief introduction. Um, but I also just wanna welcome the other delegates from wherever you are in the world to this uh, mini symposium. We really appreciate you taking time out of your busy day as well to join us here uh, online today. Just a reminder, um, as we go through the presentations, each presentation will be 20 minutes. And I ask you, if you don't mind, please, just to hold your questions until the end. So from 1.30 onwards, we have a general discussion with a question and answer session there. So please, if you could, write your questions down and just um, have them ready for the end of the, the session. That would be most appreciated. That way we can we can handle the, the questions there 
and hopefully get through the presentation so that uh, that's all fairly seamless. Look, in, in giving you some background here on smoke taint, a smoke taint and the link between smoke and a taint in the wine really became only first evident uh, back in 2003 uh, when we had some bushfires here in Australia. Uh, and we, we really, that, that, that's when we first identified that it was really a problem. And since then, you know, what we've seen is in many other regions across the world, certainly in Australia, certainly in South Africa, uh, California, Chile, and even in Europe, across Spain, Portugal, uh, Greece, uh, we've seen some big problems uh, emerge in other countries around the smoke taint issue. In Australia, you know, to be brutally honest, it's somewhere in Australia, uh, given the size of Australia, there is uh, a bushfire problem linked to a wine region most years. Uh, some years are worse than others. Uh, I think, you know, we, so uh, really bad years for us were probably 2003, 2007, 2009, uh, and, tw and 2020. So, but, you know, please, somewhere in Australia, we often have a problem with uh, fires causing smoke, causing, you know, and the, the, the smoke moves in and around vineyards and we end up with a problem somewhere. And look, the scientists online today will present and give you some of the, 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 the understanding, the technical understanding on that. In Australia alone, uh, the financial impact of fires on our industry has been estimated in excess of $1.4 billion. So just to give you an idea of the, the kind of scale uh, that has in terms of lost grape and wine production. I think since 2003, I think it's fair to say that um, there's been a, a, an amazing um, coming together of the research community here in Australia and overseas to really work on this, understand this problem, how we manage it, how we, how we, how we measure it, um, and then you know, what, what the potential options for amelioration are. So I believe today we've got a collection of great presenters that can really work through a lot of this sort of stuff. We're also seeing a lot of new uh, entrants into that R&D landscape. So we're seeing a lot of work now coming out of North America now too, and uh, also, like I said, you know, Chile, uh, South Africa and, and other areas. So we really wanted to try and share with you fairly openly today a lot of the insights that we've learned over the last um, nearly 20 years of, of dealing with these problems in Australia. And please, you know, like if there's any follow-ups that are required here, if anyone wants to ask any questions afterwards, we'd be happy to follow up and, and talk to those people. Let me now move into the presentations proper. So our, our first presentation, which I think is really important here, is to talk a bit about the extent of fires and potential smoke damage in Europe and across the world uh, in functions of years, but with a particular focus on 2022, because it, it'd been quite a, a severe uh, year in, in Europe in terms of heat waves and so forth. And to really address that today, we've got uh, Dr. Carlo uh, Bontempo here from the European Centre for Medium Range Weather Forecast, the Copernicus Centre for Climate Change Service. Uh, Carlo coordinates the activities of a number of international contracts working on the interface between climate science and decision making in sectors ranging from energy to city planning. Carlo completed his PhD in physics at the U University of La Tuqua in uh, 2004. He then moved to Canada for his postdoc before joining the Met office. Carlo worked at the Hadley Center for almost a decade where he led the climate adaptation team and more recently the climate service development team. In his role, he led numerous projects involving climate change adaptation and re regional modeling in Europe, Africa, Asia and North. So let me please hand over to Carlo now, who's gonna run us through the first presentation here. So Carlo, please over to you. Thank you, thank you, Mark. And thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be um, here with you today, even if only remotely. I think you, you can see my screen now, is that correct? I'll put it in the presentation mode. Yep, we've got that, Carlo, yep. Very good. Yes, so um, yes, in, indeed, I'm, I'm leading the, the Copernicus Climate Change Service. And um, uh, while the, the, the long list of, of sector um, doesn't include uh, viticulture and, and winemaking, it's certainly something I'm very passionate about and I hope I, I can somehow contribute a bit. So before I get into the um, 
uh, you know, into the into the meat, into the core of the presentation. I just want to acknowledge my my co-author. So Mark Parrington uh, works for uh, our sister program, uh, CAMS, and I would say something more about it, and is really working on, on fire uh, directly. And Francesca Di Giuseppe works for another uh, program of Copernicus that focuses on emergency and uh, uh, is also uh, the person behind uh, the uh, fire forecasting. And Chiara Cagnazzo works on the applications of climate data in a number of sectors. So these are uh, my quotes. And um, actually, uh, most of the work is, is theirs. Um, and I'm probably um, underestimating the contribution because it's, it's a large team and many people uh, chipped into it. So the first thing I, I would like to to highlight um, is Copernicus as a program. So uh, the Copernicus uh, program is the Earth Observation Program of the e EU, and um, a large fraction of it is about um, designing satellites, uh, launching satellites, retrieving the data from satellite. And this is the so-called space component, but then alongside the space component, there is the service component that is structured over six different services um, and I will focus today um, on, on three and uh, two of which um, ECNWF which is the European Centre for Medium Range Weather Forecast uh, leads on these are the Atmospheric uh, uh, Monitoring Service or CAMS and the Climate Change Service or C3S. Uh, we are also playing an important role in the Emergency Management Service um, but this is led by the Joint Research Centre rather than ECNWF and we are basically uh, doing the modelling support. So, um, how this uh, uh, how does it work? You know, what, what are these services providing? So, if you look, for instance, and every time you see something of a sort of light blue background, this is coming from CAMS, so from the Atmospheric Monitoring Service. And the kind of product CAMS focus on are mostly related to air quality. So, air quality has different um, uh, flavors. So, is the air quality in our cities, in, in our uh, over Europe in particular, but is also uh, the ozone layer, is also the uh, radiation, so the UV, EV, UV, UV radiation uh, uh, at, at the ground level, which is um, uh, important, is um, making predictions and estimating, for instance, fluxes. So among other things, they are looking at ways of estimating uh, CO2 fluxes now. So this is the uh, emergency, um, sorry, the atmospheric modeling service. And the other one is the climate change service I'm directly responsible for. And you can uh, look at it as a way of providing access to all sorts of data about our changing climate. So these are historical observations. Um, to, so things that allows us to, to say that last summer was in Europe, the warmest summer on, on record and we were able to do it to say that within a few days um, after the end of, of August because uh, of the data set we have um, is about predicting what's gonna or projecting what, what's gonna happen next. Um, in this case, the, when the 1.5 degrees of the Paris Agreement will be reached, but it's also looking at um, the next season. So uh, what uh, at, this, at, at, at this moment in time, I'm quite busy answering journalists who want to know whether we'll have or not a cold winter, but it can be, predicting uh, water resources in, in different basins uh, in Europe or elsewhere, as well as looking at the end of the century. So these are, for instance, maps of the risk of a heat wave. So this is just to give you a bit of an idea of the portfolio we are working with. How do we work? Uh, well, we take the, uh, the data from these Earth observation platform, this satellite, and uh, this is the, just a specific slide from the atmospheric modeling uh, uh, monitoring service, but the general approach is similar. We take the information coming from satellite. We combine those in most cases with models. So these are the, the weather model we use day in, day out to make weather predictions. And we have been doing that for the last 50 years uh, or, or so. And, um, and by joining this information together, uh, through a, a mechanism that we call data simulation, then we can make predictions. Not only we can describe the, the current situation, but we can also make prediction for the next uh, uh, few days. So um, uh, typically the product, and I should have said it more loudly at the beginning, 
but all the product we uh, provide are open and free and unrestricted, meaning that they can be used for research for sure, but they can be used for commercial application, for uh, monitoring, for developing other systems. Um, and uh, the, the product are generally global, um, although in some cases we have a higher resolution product for, for Europe. And um, as you see in this slide, there are plenty of applications um, ranging, ranging from uh, you know, uh, the, the weather prediction or the air quality prediction you see on CNN uh, or on the Weather Channel or on, on your iPhone, what, what it matters to, um, uh, or smartphone rather. Uh, to uh, specific portal uh, looking at uh, uh, air quality or uh, uh, fire risk and the like. So, um, so let's let's jump uh, directly into something that becomes uh, uh, more relevant. Um, so, one of the things, one of the of the uh, product of the output of of CAMS is very much uh, uh, about fire. Uh, and is related to GFAS, uh, and you have the link there if you want to look at it. This is a way of um, providing um, global fire emission uh, estimates, and this is done by um, looking at um, information coming from satellites. So there are different ways of looking at uh, fire. You can look at the burned area after the fire has gone, or you can look at the uh, fire relative power. So when the, the fire is burning, then there is a, a signature in the in the in the in the radiation that it emits that can be picked up from 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 satellite. So um, the system has a, a resolution of roughly ten kilometers and uh, uh, is just one day behind near real time um, and provides uh, hourly output um, sees up seven hours be behind real time. Um, Yes, and, and the aerosol emissions are estimated using factors de dependent on, on the vegetation type. So um, this is just a, a, an animation uh, where you see the fire relative power in, in what per square meter uh, as evolving, and this is uh, 2020. So you see uh, the things that you, you would expect uh, in, in sort of the tropical belt in, in Africa and uh, in South America. Indonesia and the like, you see uh, fires in Eastern Europe and, and you see the, the fires uh, in North America. This is still April. So um, let's just uh, make an extra step and uh, look at the um, 2022. Uh, so uh, as you, as I mentioned before, uh, 2022, looking at our uh, data set has been the warmest uh, uh, summer and is in, in, in a, in is on track to actually result one of the warmest, if not the warmest year overall for Europe, but was certainly the warmest summer after another record-breaking summer just a year before. Um, and it was exceeding the previous re uh, record by nearly half a, half a degree. So really uh, an exceptional event, also a very dry summer. Um, and um, while overall in some region, well, like Portugal, it wasn't particularly uh, the fire wasn't particularly uh, um, prominent. Uh, certainly, in, in other region, Spain and, and France in particular, the fire was very significant. So, this is um, um, these are time series of the total fire relative power for different um, different um, uh, countries, where you see the emission in uh, in 2022 with respect to the uh, in red with respect to the average emissions. That you uh, in the period 20, 2003 to 2021, um, because out of those you can estimate the uh, wildfire carbon emission. And clearly, I'm not at all an expert of the impact that this emission may have on on wine and and, and its taste. But um, I, I would I, I would argue probably that uh, uh, the impact on wine is probably associated to the uh, overall uh, total uh, in uh, carbon emissions. Um, so th these are um, these are regional air quality forecasts. So these are the high resolution product for uh, for Europe. There are also the, the global, and I will say uh, I will show some of those. But you see uh, uh, animation this 2022. You see the, the fire in, in Western France that was very prominent, very significant, and uh, was picked up by by uh, by many newspapers. And this information, the the links are there. Is just to say that this information exists is accessible is open and free and uh, the maps uh, so the animation here 
looks at the uh, PM 2.5 uh, maximum concentration uh, at the surface. So this is the small particulate matter, the one that typically has an impact on our health and, and at times shut down uh, transport in cities for that reason. And uh, the interesting bit is that you, you can uh, compare uh, the uh, model output with in situ observation. So these are coming from uh, Aeronet. And, uh, uh, and, and you see that um, the, the Aeronet point are those in, in the, the, the dotted uh, things in blue and the different uh, uh, curved uh, different lines represent different uh, elements in the, in, the, in the output where you see the, um, the total the carbon picking up exactly when the Aeronet is in. In some, in some places, the, the correlation is better than others, but generally speaking, I think you would agree with me that the, the system is performing quite nicely. Um, now, moving from atmospheric uh, monitoring uh, and joining forces with the emergency management service, which um, is responsible for forecasting the fire danger over the uh, 10, 10 days period um, and another of these Copernicus program, then we can look at the correlation between you know, what the forecast is saying and then now it compares on the ground. So um, this, is, uh, this is California in this case. Um, uh, and and what, uh, what the plot shows is the percentage of pixel exceeding uh, a specific threshold for relative power. So you see observation on the horizontal axis and forecast uh, uh, date on, on the vertical axis where you see, um, and, and, and you see these uh, uh, peaks uh, where the, the actually there has been uh, event of fire. So again, is, is a, um, in this case, is um, I think what really matters is the fact that uh, the forecast uh, is well verified against uh, uh, the observation. And this was uh, um, uh, a very significant, as, as I don't have to tell you, but it was a very significant event for, uh, for California, um, this 2020. And again, you can, see, you can compare the uh, specific year with the climatology and see uh, how, how things, uh, in, in what sense it was exceptional in that case. Um, more plots about the specific, uh, uh, season but the, the one i want to show is, is, is this animation because um I, I guess um when when you look at the at the impact that fires had on the the, the taste in in wine you're looking at a global problem and uh, uh, the global issue and i'm sorry this plot is still uh, only northern hemisphere but uh, similar kind of plot can be can be made anywhere but what in this case the mess the, the message behind this animation is that after the fire, and, and this is uh, carbon monoxide rather than, than CO2, um, the, the fire, uh, what happened in this case in California, doesn't stay in California, and actually is advected, is moved by winds downstream and can have an impact, uh, not only on the Eastern United States, but even reach uh, uh, the Western side of, of Europe a few, a few days later. Um, the, the, the next thing I, I want to mention is, um, is about uh, the connection again between the emergency management and the Copernicus Climate Change Service, because um, we have looked at the observation, we looked at our model and satellite together can uh, describe the current situation. We have looked at how we can go a step uh, a step forward and, and see what's going to happen in the next in the next few uh, days. But then the, the next question is, what can we do if we one step further, what can we say about the long-term future? So seasonal evolution and climate change projection. And this is more of, um, you know, is where the climate change service steps in, if you want. So this is um, a paper that came out uh, on, on nature uh, recently. And, and that uh, this is uh, the, the picture is directly taken from the paper and the references underneath. And this is again, looking at Europe um, and looking at uh, the fire risk uh, the, the fire danger index, which is a, still a measure uh, similar to the one to, to the one used in the, in the, in the seasonal element, to look at how the risk of fire is changing uh, over Europe. So this is uh, based on on fire weather index, if you want. And uh, what you see here, I think, is quite 
re remarkable, especially now that we look at it after the summer we had with this large fire in regions that are not normally so prone to fire in Western and Central Europe. So you see the increase in risk in Southern Europe, as many would expect, um, that is also still with large variations uh, from year to year in the, in the fire danger index. But you uh, uh, also see a, a definite trend in the risk of um, fire danger in uh, Central Europe, which is a region that so far had a small uh, fire risk. And this is coming uh, out of, uh, of the observation. But if you look a step further, so this is basically what has happened. But if you look a step further and you look what might happen in the future, there are two uh, elements to highlight is that generally the, the, the fire, um, the fire uh, risk is going up. So th what you see at the bottom is this, um, is the increase in the 90 percent fire, so in the most uh, in the most intense uh, uh, risk uh, period in two different scenarios. So the RCP 4.5, so medium emission scenario, and a uh, uh, unmitigated scenario of 8.5, which, while possibly slightly unlikely now, is still uh, a possibility if we don't manage to reduce our emission. And in this case, the fire risk as you see, increased dramatically in a significant swath of, of Southern and even uh, Eastern Europe. The second element to highlight is coming from observation, it's the top left corner, and it's basically saying that the correlation between emission, so uh, which is what probably matters for, for, uh, for wine, and this, the risk after it's changing over time and it's getting, um, it's getting worse. Um, the last thing, and then I close, um, is what you see on, on, on the right, because all this data is interesting and uh, uh, fascinating, but it's not useful if you cannot handle it and, and play with it. So if you have time and interest, you can scan the QR code on the bottom right. This should lead you to an application that sits on, on our cloud uh, server and allows you to explore uh, the risk of fire and now this uh, has been changing over time and it's likely to change in the future, uh, just interrogating the data uh, directly, but through a nice user um, interface. So this is just um, my conclusion in the interest of time. I just don't read them. I, I, I keep them here for, uh, for you, but uh, I wrap up here. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Carlo. Some really, really rich uh, data and information there. And I think the, um, you know, I think the scary thing, and we, we, we see this in Australia too, Carlo, that you know, a lot of the climate change modelling uh, really predicts obviously a warmer, drier future and you know, a more uh, uh, risk, you know, the, the, the environment is riskier for more fires as well. So I think you know, really, really good data provided there. Thank you. And, and please, again, just if you can hold your questions for Carlo until the end, um, that would be most appreciated, please. Okay, so I might just get you to unshare. Yeah, thank you, unshare screen. Um, I'm now going to introduce Dr. Mango Parker. Uh, Mango is a research scientist uh, uh, leading a team at the AWRI in, in sensory and chemical impact of smoke. Mango's work focuses on the link between grape composition, wine composition, and the sensory effects and the impact of early season smoke exposure. Mango has 20 years of wine, uh, wine research experience and is involved in smoke tank research since, since 2009. Her research interests include wine flavour chemistry and phenolic chemistry. Mango has recently completed her PhD studies uh, in looking at glycoside flavour release during wine consumption. And she enjoys the challenge of bringing together complex science and practical outcomes. Can I introduce Mango here today to talk about the link between wine composition and sensory perception of smoke taint in wine. Thank you, Mango. Thank you very much, Mark, and thank you to the Enovidi um, group for having us here. I'm really pleased to be able to share our research in Australia with you. I'll just prepare to share my screen here. Hopefully everybody can see that all right. Um, so Mark asked me to talk to you about linking wine composition with sensory aspects of smoke taint, but I realized that for many in the audience, 
smoke taint is not as familiar as it is to us here in Australia. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time just going back and explaining um, how smoke taint works, how it affects the grapes and wine from the chemical point of view. And then I'll go and talk about the recent research that we've been doing here at the AWRI. So what happens when smoke enters the vineyards? Um, smoke's actually a very complicated mixture that's made up of volatile phenols, such as guaiacol, cresols and syringols, as well as many other chemical compounds and particles in a very complex and dynamic changing mixture. Um, the volatile phenols that I've listed here are the ones that we found affect the wine grapes the most. And the way that they affect the grapes is actually the volatile phenols are taken up by the grapes. Um, it's not possible to remove them just by washing the grapes. They're taken up um, into the grape tissue very rapidly when the smoke enters the vineyard. But the story doesn't stop with volatile phenols. Quickly within hours and certainly days after the smoke exposure, volatile phenols are converted in the grapes. They are metabolized and glycosides are formed. So um, in a, an effort for the, the tissues of the, the berries and the leaves, the plant attaches sugar molecules to detoxify the volatile phenols. Um, there are a lot of volatile phenol glycosides that are formed. Syringol gentiobiocide, SYGG, is an excellent marker. And in Australia, that's the, the glycoside that we see that's most abundant in grapes following a smoke exposure. But it's not just one metabolite that's formed. There's a lot of different glycosides, and I've listed some there which are commonly used to measure in grapes, but we know that there are many others. So smoke affected grapes can have high concentrations of both volatile phenols and glycosides. And in Australia, we've spent a lot of time and effort to understand the concentrations that are present in grapes that haven't been exposed to smoke. So now we can confidently identify grapes that have been exposed to smoke by comparing to the concentrations that are found without smoke exposure. And this is a, I've got the reference there for a paper which has been recently published open access. So that's available to everybody to see. So that's all about the grapes. When we make wine from those grapes, the volatile phenols, any volatile phenols and glycosides that are in the grapes can be transferred into the wine. Um, in addition, volatile phenols can be released from glycosides during the winemaking and potentially to some extent during the aging of the wine as well. So wine made from heavily smoke affected grapes can be high in both volatile phenols and glycosides. Now I realize that for many in the audience you may not have had a chance to taste smoke tainted wines I would be very surprised if you've tasted Australian smoke tainted wines because our winemakers are very aware and can detect smoke taint early so that they don't release these wines onto the market. But thinking about the aroma of the wine, which is largely due to the volatile phenols um, in, from smoke, um, wine can be smoky and medicinal and can contain these, the guaiacol and the cresols and other volatile phenols in a complex mixture. And you can see there just looking at the sensory descriptors, um, the, the characters there in the aroma can, can be quite varied. And it's important to note that often we see smoke tainted wines that seem smoky, even when the individual volatile phenols are below their thresholds, which I've listed there. And that's because it's due to a combination and not just one compound. Um, the glycosides also give another aspect to the taste of the wine, and that is that they can contribute to a smoky aftertaste. So the glycosides 
don't have any aroma, the, the sugars render the glycosides too heavy to be volatile, so they can't be detected by odor. But they can be, the volatile phenols can be released from the glycosides in the mouth during the action, through the action of oral microbiota. So that can lead to very unpleasant and lingering smoky aftertastes in smoke tainted wines. When so with the analysis of the volatile phenols and the glycosides, which we offer here at AWRI, um, we can interpret that analysis in a couple of different ways. Firstly, um, now we're very confident that we can identify if grapes have been smoke exposed or not. If they're consistent with clean, non-smoke exposed grapes, then the wine can be made with typical winemaking protocols. But if they have been exposed, the question that we've been working on is, can we predict the smoky flavor in the wine from measuring the markers in the grapes? And is it possible to make a reasonable wine after some adjustments to winemaking protocols from those smoke exposed grapes? So we made a lot of wines in the last couple of years from real smoke events. And here I'm just putting a, an overall summary of what we found, how well along the X axis, we have categorized the wines according to whether they were smoke exposed by analysis of the chemical markers or not. And then on the Y axis, we have the sensory characteristics. So if the wine was smokier compared to the clean control, or not. And we were very pleased to find that there were zero wines. We haven't seen any here in the red box, which were classified as clean according to our smoke exposure markers, but turned out to taste smoky. And, and that was a big relief to us. So we're very happy with the way that our smoke markers are working. On the other hand, not all the wines that were smoke exposed had a significantly stronger smoky flavor compared to the controls. So that's quite interesting. And we're trying to understand how to um, distinguish those wines in the gray box from the black box and how we can go ahead and process those wines to make better outcomes. So really key questions that we've been working on here at AWRI are, can the smoke exposure markers in the grapes predict the smoky flavor in the wine? And what concentrations result in unacceptable smoky flavor? Knowing that low concentrations of guaiacol particularly are typically found in many red wines and some guaiacol as such is not necessarily a taint compound. So we've collected a lot of grapes from three key varieties that are important to us here in Australia and also to you more broadly across the whole world, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir and Shiraz. We've collected altogether 65 different batches of grapes and produced wines with no effort to remediate the smoke flavour to see if those wines with different levels of smoke exposure would be classified as strongly smoky. The sensory assessment was by a trained panel for smoke flavor, and we've been following those wines for some time now. So firstly, talking about linking the wine compounds to smoke flavor. As I said before, it's quite a complicated flavor due to a lot of different compounds that can be there in different proportions. So it's not just as simple as measuring guaiacol and, and methyl guaiacol. What we found is that when we model the smoke flavor using the wine composition, we can have very good predictive models using PLS models. There is a high degree of correlation among the compounds and there's a subset of volatile phenols and glycosides that are important. Syringol gentiobiocide is an excellent biomarker for exposure, but it's not particularly important to model the smoke flavor in the wine. Here's an example 
of, of a subset of 12 Pinot Noir samples. So um, here is a slightly simplified model where we have a subset of wine smoke impact volatiles um, being used to model smoke flavor. And you can see that this is a very nice model. And I apologize here, I'm sure you'll understand that this work is in the process of being published. So I can't share the details with you now, but hopefully it will be available um, to share quite soon. Again, um, confirming what we saw in previous sample sets that even when the individual compounds are below their individual reported sensory thresholds, we can still see wines with significant smoky flavor. So the combination of the volatiles are important even when they're below their individual thresholds. Now, I just wanted to show that for different varieties, the slope and the, the function is slightly different. But um, firstly, thinking about Chardonnay, the wine was made without skin contact, just with a typical white wine production style. And the smoke flavor was a lot less than the smoke flavor that was found in the red wines. And we're putting that down to the lack of skin contact, um, which also reduces the amount of volatile phenols, the concentration of volatile phenols in the final wine. But even comparing the Pinot Noir and the Shiraz, you can see that a different concentration of volatiles was found in the different varieties and a different slope on this curve. Um, and that's because there's different chemical composition of those smoke compounds in those different varieties, which is quite interesting. But it does mean that um, it's not possible to have just one model that can be applied broadly to all different varieties. It's a bit more difficult to link grape and wine composition, um, especially when we're talking about reds and whites. What I can tell you is that there was a variable proportion of smoke markers going from grapes to wine. So I can't just tell you that 75% was extracted into the wine. Um, some compounds were extracted quite a lot into the wine, some were reduced during the fermentation and some were increased. So it's a little bit challenging to draw some generalizations there, but nonetheless, we have attempted to model the smoke flavor from the grape composition. And, and here's just an example. We were pleasantly surprised to see that in fact, a subset of the grape volatile phenol and phenols and glycosides um, could predict the smoke flavor rating by a sensory panel using PLS regression models. And even though there was that variation in the compounds from grapes to wine, we actually had very good models for each variety. Again, a separate model was required for each variety, but this really gives us confidence that the markers that we are measuring are really important for the flavor. Now, I'm conscious that uh, I don't have a lot of time left, and this is a little bit beyond what Mark asked me to talk about, but I thought you'd be interested to hear about how consumers feel and how they like um, smoky wines, the smoke-tainted wines. And what I can tell you is that they don't like it. So we've done three different studies here on Chardonnay, Shiraz and Pinot Noir Rosé wines. And the higher the smoke flavour was rated by our sensory panel, the less that consumers liked the wines overall. And there was a very strong negative correlation there. The interesting thing about consumers is that not all consumers are the same. So here we are showing a consumer sensory study that we did with Shiraz wines and the consumers disliked 
the wines with the higher smoke flavor. Um, those are the ones with the red bars. The green ones were the clean control wines. So the overall consumers disliked the, the strongly smoke flavored wines, but we can actually break down the consumers into three main clusters of different likings. There was one cluster that was highly sensitive. So they disliked even a very small amount of the smoke flavor. Another cluster, quite a large proportion, again, was similar to the overall liking of all the consumer groups. So they disliked um, the stronger smoke flavored wines. And then a small proportion, only 19% in this example, um, weren't really responding to the smoke flavor and we can't really explain um, their preferences. And we saw slightly different proportions of those consumers, but the three different types in each of the three consumer studies that we've done in the different wine matrices. So I think it's fair to say that there are consumers out there who are highly sensitive to smoke, who dislike smoke just as much as the sensitive winemakers out there. And that can be quite a large proportion of consumers, um, over 50% in this case. So it's definitely something that's real with consumers and not a problem that winemakers have found that's out of touch with the consumer palate. So just to conclude, we've found over the last few years that clean grapes can be reliably identified. So that's really nice. That means that for vineyards that can be cleared of smoke taint, the winemakers can go ahead and make that wine and rest assured that the risk of it being smoky is, is very, very low. We have identified the key compounds related to smoky flavour. And now in Australia, we feel that we are better able to manage the ongoing challenge of smoke better. So I would like to thank a lot of people who contributed to this work. It was put together in a bit of a rush as real smoke events were happening. So I'd like to acknowledge a lot of people for their efforts there. And I've just picked out a few key references because I skipped over them quite quickly in the presentation if you'd like to read any more about that. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Mango, and uh, yeah, very thorough. So I think uh, so a good oversight and insight into where the team at AWRI are up to and really understanding that link between uh, the chemical markers and the actual sensory taint and uh, really understanding how to predict that as well as we can. Um, and this has been really critical for making sure that, um, you know, we, we, we're able to identify these problems and making sure that we can help producers make wines during these challenging times so that uh, they're not releasing uh, smoke affected wines that can be put into the market that can affect their brands and their reputation. That's the really critical thing there. So thank you, Mango. Let's move on to our third speaker here um, today. So I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Kerry Wilkinson. Kerry is the Professor of Enology at the University of Adelaide here uh, as well. Her primary research interests concern the flavour chemistry of grapes and wine, uh, in, including the impact of bushfire smoke on grapes and wine, looking at the improved utility of oak wood for wine maturation, uh, the influence of production method on the composition and sensory profiles of sparkling wine, and other areas of interest include the chemical and sensory analysis of food and beverages and their appeal to consumers. Um, Kerry's here today. I think Kerry's been on this journey with me in a research sense probably about as long as me, Kerry. Um, you're here today to talk about options to address amelioration of smoke tainted wine. So over to you, Kerry. Thanks, Mark. Beautiful. All right. Thank you. Um, so, yes, today I'd like to talk to you about strategies for amelioration of smoke taint. Um, just by way of background, 
So there's quite a lot of work that's obviously been done trying to uh, address this um, issue. And there are a number of studies that have looked at mitigation strategies in the vineyard, which I won't talk about today, but there are a number of, of papers here that you may like to look at if you're, you're interested. Um, probably some of the work coming through around protective sprays and protective coverings is um, the most promising work in that field. And then obviously there's been a lot of work trying to mitigate smoke taint in the winery. Um, and again, um, I can't talk about all of these um, studies today. Um, I'm gonna to focus on a couple that I think are, are most promising. Um, but again, there are a number of papers if you're, you're interested in, in following up on those other studies. So probably one of the um, strategies that has been in play for, for the longest is simply the use of, of different adsorbent materials to try to remove the smoke taint marker compounds um, from affected wine. So that's where I'll start off today. So we started um, this sort of work um, more than 10 years ago um, with a, a preliminary screening trial, just having a look at a range of commercial fining agents and their ability to remove um, volatile phenols. Um, in fact, we did this work so early that, that in, in the piece, in terms of the, the context of smoke taint research, that we, we didn't have methods um, available for all of the glycoconjugates at, at this stage. Um, and just looking at the ability of different fining agents to remove volatile phenols from um, smoke affected wine. And so you can see that from a range of, of different um, commercial adsorbents that we, we looked at, um, it was really an activated carbon that gave us the most promising results. Um, and there was a little bit of an impact on, on colour, as we know, activated carbon um, can impact other desirable wine constituents. Um, but even this activated carbon affected colour far less than other fining agents. So from here, we took this through to a more detailed study um, and we applied activated carbon treatments to two smoke affected red wines, a Cabernet Sauvignon and a Merlot. Um, and again, we can see there was a statistically significant removal of the volatile phenols that were, were present um, in those wines. Um, again, um, a small, but in this case, not statistically significant impact on, on colour density. Um, and Mango's given you a really great introduction to some of the, the smoke related um, attributes that we can, can see in smoke affected wines. Um, and so in each of these cases, we've got the solid green line is our, our starting smoke affected wine. We can see that they're, they're both characterized by smoky and cold ash aromas, um, smoky flavors and ashy aftertaste, and also a diminished intensity of fruit aroma and flavor. And then each of these wines, when they were treated with activated carbon, we saw a, a very significant reduction in the intensity of those, those smoke attributes. Um, and in this case, also an intensification of, of fruit, aroma and flavour as we've removed the, the smoky character that was, was masking um, that fruit expression. So this was really, you know, promising results um, and why, you know, many winemakers today are, are still using activated carbon to um, ameliorate smoke tainted wine. We're still working on different adsorbent materials um, and we've got a, a, a trial that's underway at the moment where we're looking at a number of different um, novel adsorbents. So we're still comparing a number of different commercial um, carbons that are, um, are readily available, but also looking at molecularly imprinted polymers, um, which ideally you know, are, are being tailored to more specifically remove compounds that we know are associated with uh, smoke taint. Um, and then also a, a proprietary resin. And so in this particular experiment, we have um, commercial wines um, that came about following the 2020 um, fires in, in Australia. Um, and we can see we've got a Chardonnay that's quite heavily smoke tainted, um, a Rosé that um, has a relatively low level of, of smoke taint, um, and then a Cabernet Sauvignon um, that's moderately smoke tainted, more sort of volatile phenols than the, than the glycoconjugates. And these are the results that we get when we've treated each of these wines directly with different carbons and also our, our molecularly imprinted polymer, our MIP, um, and also our, our resin. And we can see in, in some of the cases, the, the carbons are still performing better. So certainly in the rosé and the red wine, we're seeing some of the, the greatest removal still occurring by um, different, different carbons. 
Um, but we can see in some instances, the, the MIP, particularly in the, the volatile phenols in the Chardonnay um, is performing quite well. Um, and we can see that the, um, in some instances, the, the resin is also working quite well. What we can also see from the, the bottom figure, um, so this is the removal of glycoconjugates, we can see that removing volatile phenols from wines is much easier than removing uh, glycoconjugates. So we can see in the case of the Chardonnay, it's only the resin that's removed a, a significant portion of the glycoconjugates, but in general, it's still you know, a relatively small amount. And this is part of the challenge with you know, amelioration strategies that we're trying to remove things that are both volatile and non-volatile um, at the same time. And, and that's what makes this um, quite complicated. So this work is, um, is ongoing, trying to understand how we can improve the, the use of these different adsorbent materials. So next I'll move on to our work on membrane filtration. Um, and again, this is work that we started off um, more than 10 years ago, looking at um, the application of nanofiltration um, as part of the remediation process, um, using it in conjunction with adsorbent materials. Um, so to explain this process, we start with our, our uh, smoke affected wine in our treatment tank. We're pumping that wine across um, a semi-permeable membrane. Um, and in the early work, we were working with um, nanofilters. So these had a nominal molecular weight cut off of around about 150 to, to 200 atomic mass units. So the idea is that the larger molecules that are present in wine, so things like tannin, for example, and polysaccharides, proteins, are going to be retained by the membrane. So they stay in what we refer to as the retentate. And those smaller molecules, including our, our volatile phenols, would pass through the membrane into the permeate. We can then take that permeate fraction and selectively treat that with an adsorbent um, material, such as an activated carbon or, or a resin, um, and then take the treated permeate, recombine it with the retentate um, and pass it back to the treatment tank. And so in this way, we can essentially loop um, our wine through this system um, and continue to process it and progressively remove um, volatile phenols from the wine over time. And so um, just to give you an idea of, of what the different fractions look like. So here we've got a retentate fraction in the first glass. The middle glass is our, our permeate fraction. So you can see that all of the anthocyanins and tannins have been retained in that retentate fraction. Um, and so essentially what we're trying to do is, is more selectively treat different components of the wine and protect some of the more desirable attributes. Then in the third glass, you know, we've restored the, the permeate and the retentate and, and we recover our, our wine. So to give you an idea of, of some of the, um, the outcomes from this early research, um, this is the data from a, a pilot scale treatment of a smoke affected Pinot Noir. Um, and um, in this particular study, we, we measured a number of different um, volatile phenols. So at this stage, we weren't looking at creosols or syringol yet. Um, and possibly this wine had more issues with Britannomyces than, than smoke taint. But nevertheless, you can see that as we progressively treated this wine, the concentration of volatile phenols that were present um, decreased with time. In this particular um, instance, we did go back and have a look at the glycoconjugates in the untreated and the treated wines. And what we found was, um, as we might expect, glycoconjugates being of higher molecular mass, they were being retained by the, the nanofilter. So they were present in the retentate and not in the, in the permeate. So they weren't being removed through that, that treatment process. And so they um, remained in the, in the, fit, in the treated wine um, as a consequence of their, their higher molecular weight. And that can have implications for the sensory properties of that, that final wine, because obviously they can you know, contribute to the, percep the sensory perception of smoke tank through that in-mouth um, hydrolysis that can occur. Nevertheless, if we look at the sensory data for treatment of, of that particular wine, we can still see that there was a, a significant reduction in the intensity of, of smoke and cold ash aromas, smoky flavours and the ashy aftertaste. Um, but in this instance, we didn't see um, any change in the expression of, of fruit characteristics. So this is a particular area that we think, um, you know, has quite a lot of um, um, uh, promise. So we then took this through to an industrial scale treatment. 
Um, and this time we had a, a smoke affected wine that had been made on a, a commercial scale. Um, and again, we can see a reduction in some of the key marker compounds. So um, before treatment, you know, 12 micrograms per litre of glycol and five or four methyl glycol. We can see that post-treatment, um, we've significantly reduced those concentrations. In this particular study, we put some of this wine down and, and in the cellar and we came back and we, we tracked the concentration of volatile phenols over time. And what we saw was um, a slow increase in, in the concentration of these marker compounds with time. And this was in the early days of sort of starting to understand how the volatile phenol glycoconjugates behaved. And so it seemed reasonable to us that what we were seeing was the slow hydrolysis of these volatile phenol glycoconjugates. And so therefore we were releasing glycol and 4-methyl glycol. Um, and that's what we reported in this study. And we've probably initiated this idea that smoke tank can return after um, membrane filtration treatment or, or even any remediation treatment of wine. But we actually conducted a, um, a bottle aging study a, a number of years later. We had a number of wines that we um, had bottled back in, in 2010 from a, a large um, smoke tank trial. Um, and you can see in this instance, we had um, both control wines and smoke affected wines. So we created these wines by applying smoke in vineyard fuel trials. Um, and you can see we achieved elevated concentrations of, of volatile phenols in those wines. But we returned and revisited these wines six years after bottle aging, so in 2016. And interestingly, we did see some changes in some of the, the volatile phenol concentrations. So we did see increases in glycol and 4-methylglycol. Surprisingly, the cresol concentrations actually decreased um, and we saw significant increases in syringol. But where this became interesting was that we saw these increases not only in the smoke-affected wines, but in the corresponding control wines. So what that tells us is there are clearly some of these um, compounds that are naturally occurring in particularly red grape varieties. And so these increases were going to occur in the wines regardless of you know, any, any remediation treatment um, because whatever precursor was resulting in their release was going to happen in the, in the control um, wine as well. So it's fair to say that the volatile phenol glycoconjugates are probably more stable than we initially thought. Um, and we now reinterpret the data from our early nanofiltration trials and suggest that the perceived increase in sensory um, perception of smoke taint may actually be a result of diminished fruit expression over time, particularly in lighter wine styles, rather than the smoke taint is intensif intensifying due to um, glycoconjugate hydrolysis. This work again is very much ongoing for us, but where, what we are doing now is moved, we've moved away from um, focusing on nanofiltration, we're actually now looking at ultrafiltration. So this is some data from a pilot scale fractionation of the, the smoke affected Chardonnay wine that I, I mentioned earlier. Um, and we've done two sets of experiments here. Um, we've put our Chardonnay wine firstly through ultrafiltration using 5, 10 and 20 kilodalton um, uh, membranes. So much larger molecular weight cutoffs. Um, and then what we've also done is to take the permeate fraction. So what passes through the membrane in each instance um, and then also put it through a nanofiltration treatment and have a look at the essentially the partitioning of smoke tank marker compounds into the different permeate and retentate fractions. And so what we can see is with volatile phenols, irrespective of these treatments, we're seeing pretty well equal you know, um, concentrations in both permeate and retentate fractions. It's really only when we move to, to nanofiltration um, we start to see a little bit of um, retention of syringol and 4-methyl syringol in the nanofilter retentate. And so we've done the same thing and looked at the glycoconjugate, um, the volatile phenol glycoconjugates in these samples. And this is where we're starting to see retention. So obviously these molecules being much larger, we see them being retained um, on the basis of the, the different molecular weight cutoffs. So most heavily concentrated when we use a five kilodalton um, molecular weight cutoff membrane. And then if we take the ultrafiltration permeate and put that through a nanofilter, that's where we see 
uh, essentially that much tighter membrane is preventing the, the passage of those glycoconjugates into the, the nanofilter retentate. So this is where we're doing our ongoing work now, looking at how we can treat these different um, membrane filtration fractions and see if we can't achieve you know, a better strategy of, of remediation. So lastly, what I'd like to talk to you about um, is some of our work on, on distillation. Um, and so for anyone who's not familiar with spinning cone column distillation, it's a technique that, that typically would be used for, for dealkalization of, of wine. Um, it works essentially by having um, this large um, cylindrical tank and within this tank we've got a, a rotating shaft and attached to the shaft um, we have a, a cone and because it's attached to the spinning shaft it then spins and then it alternates these, these spinning cones with stationary cones that are fixed to the inside of the, um, the column. And so we essentially have these alternating spinning cones and stationary cones within our system. So what then happens is we can introduce our wine into the top of the, um, the inlet, the top of the, um, the, the tank, um, and that liquid will pass down the stationary um, column. It'll pool in the bottom of the spinning column, but then because of centrifugal forces, it, it gets, um, it passes up the, the um, spinning cone um, and then we'll, as a consequence of gravity, it'll hit the inner wall and then drop down to the next stationary column, then it will flow down um, and so on and so on. And so we have this downward flow of liquid. At the same time, we're introducing steam at the bottom of the spinning cone column um, and that vapor is gonna flow upwards. And so it's passing over these thin stream of, of liquid on each of the cones and mixing, um, as it, as it passes up. And so it's stripping the volatile compounds, you know, out of the system. And so we can collect that vapor and condense it as, as condensate. Um, and then at the top of the column, and then at the bottom, we can collect our, our stripped wine. Um, and typically, you know, we might have a, a stripping rate of say 29% and that might, you know, ordinarily would achieve um, complete um, dealkalization of the wine. So we were interested in whether this might be a way of fractionating um, smoke affected wines. So we took a commercially made smoke affected Shiraz Sangiovese wine. Um, it had reasonable levels of, of, of smoke tank marker compounds, um, albeit from a sensory perspective, probably wasn't the most um, heavily smoke tainted wine to start with. But we put this through our, our spinning cone column treatment. Um, and we collected samples after 1% stripping, 14% stripping and 28% stripping. So um, that's removing um, a percentage of the original wine volume that we started with. And so we got some interesting results. Um, so we can see that within each of the stripped wines, we still have plenty of volatile phenols there. See a slight decrease in, in concentration in, in glycol. And so what we're seeing is that it's actually very difficult um, when we're treating wine for the volatiles to be, volatile phenols to be removed from the, the wine. We really only see a small amount um, of predominantly glycol, some cresols um, being carried into that, that condensate fraction. Um, in the case of syringol, we don't see any of that in the condensate, and we only see that, that concentration effect. So we've got this competing concentration of volatile phenols in the stripped wine as the volume decreases because we're removing water and ethanol through the, the distillation process, but then also a small amount of, of stripping occurring, but not a, a significant amount. And so when we then look at the volatile, so yeah, the volatile phenol glycoconjugates, because these are actually not volatile, these are retained wholly in the, the stripped wine. And so what we see is just a concentration effect and we don't see any of the, the glycoconjugates present in the, in the condensate as, you know, as we might expect. So essentially what we found, if we have a look at the sensory data, um, so again, the solid green line is our, our control wine pretreatment. Um, and what we're seeing is that as we continue to, to strip this wine, we're progressively exacerbating the smoke taint. Um, we see concentrations of acids, concentration of volatile phenols in the glycoconjugates, such that the smoke attributes, those, those smoky aromas, um, smoky flavors, and the, and the ashy aftertaste are actually being 
um, enhanced. Um, and we perform this experiment on, on two particular wines and we, we see the same results. So we start with our, um, our smoke affected wines. So a Shiraz Sangiovese and a Petit Verdot Sangiovese positioned on the left hand side, being driven by the most intense fruit attributes. And as we continue to strip these wines, removing you know, more of the alcohol and, and water from them, we're essentially removing the desirable aroma, flavor, aroma and flavour compounds, um, removing the ethanol and basically exacerbating acids, salts um, and smoke tank characteristics. So in conclusion from this trial, we would suggest that spinning cone column distillation is, is not the solution um, for remediating wine, but what it does do is probably generate um, a component that we could actually then treat with remediation um, you know, strategies such as the addition of, of activated carbon or in another absorbent material, um, remediate that and then take our condensate um, with the desirable aromas and flavours, recombine them, um, and that might give us a, a better outcome. And just to finish up, um, our industry partner in, in this trial was also interested in looking at the application of spinning cone column distillation on smoke tainted juice. Um, and so what they did was to take um, a red juice made from um, a number of different uh, red grape varieties that had been um, exposed to, to smoke. Um, they clarified the, the resulting juice, um, put it through a, a heat treatment, um, and then processed it through spinning cone column distillation to a 25% strip rate. That condensate that they obtained um, from that treatment process, they then put through a deionization process, so a, an inline anion cation exchange column. Um, and when I asked about this later, they indicated that it wasn't specifically that they were looking at deionizing the, the, the condensate, they were actually using it as an absorption step. So they then took that treated condensate, recombined it with the stripped juice, um, and then uh, took that reconstituted juice, fermented it and obtained a red wine. And so we took different samples throughout that process and had a look at what was going on with the, the chemistry. And we can see the starting red juice had a number of, um, you, you know, the volatile phenols present. Um, and I've, I've just included um, a subset of our glycoconjugate data. We can see that clarification hasn't really changed the, the composition of the smoke tank marker compounds. But in this instance, when we look at the condensate, we see that the volatile phenols have actually carried over into that condensate. So that's in contrast to the results that we had from the, the wine treatment. So we think that that reflects like a, essentially a salting out effect as a consequence of the, the high sugar content. Treating that condensate um, with the iron exchange column has then essentially removed all of those volatile phenols such that when we recombine the, the treated condensate and the strict juice, we end up with a reconstituted juice that has much lower, at least glycol and cresol levels. What we are seeing is some release of syringol um, from its, you know, its, its precursors through that, that heat treatment process. And then through fermentation, we're releasing a small amount of additional volatile phenols and also some, some syringol. So again, to me, these are quite promising results. And it could be that had we used a, a more selective absorbent material, maybe you know, uh, an activated carbon or you know, one of our other um, novel absorbents, um, we may have seen um, you know, some better outcomes as well. And so this is an area that we'll probably look into in a bit more detail and, and take it through to a, a sensory outcome. So I will leave it there um, just to acknowledge the, the various um, staff and students that have been involved in this research, um, our collaborators at AWRI, um, also our industry partners, and then also our, our various funding bodies. Thank you. Thank you, Kerry. Thank you for sharing your latest insights there too. I think that was really, really interesting. Um, listen, we, we've got to keep moving just because we are running a little bit behind time now, but. Our last speaker in the session uh, is Dr. Alana Seabrook. So Alana's worked in the wine industry for the past 20 years in winemaking, wine research and application, wine microbiology, diagnostics and, and labor, uh, laboratory services. After completing her winemaking degree through the University of Verona, Italy, uh, she also worked, went on then to complete a PhD in wine microbiology at the University of Adelaide for working then in industry as a, as a microbiologist and an R&D manager in an industry setting. 
Alana has been working as the technical manager for Lafort Australia since 2017, as well as managing technical communications for the Wine Check Laboratories group from two, uh, since January to, uh, 2022. Alana is a current uh, member and board member of the Australian Society for Viticulture and Enology and also a director of the Australian uh, Wine Industry Technical Conference. Alana is our last speaker, as I mentioned today, and here to talk to us about BioLafort uh, practical experiences in managing smoke taint. So, uh, Alana, I'll hand over to you to go full screen and um, we're in your hands. Okay, thank you so much, Mark. Uh... Can you see the screen, Mark, as it should be? Yeah, we've got it. Thank you, Alana. It's in full screen. Fantastic. Um, I'd like to say thank you very much for the invitation. It was um, our BioLafort team who um, asked me to speak today. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. So I was... You've heard, in my view, you've already heard the science from Mango and Kerry, um, and in my view, there are no better. So you've heard the best of the best. So I deliberately chose not to do an ultra scientific presentation. Um, and instead I wanted to talk about winemaking choices that are faced by winemakers um, when they deal with smoke affected grapes, what they can do um, and what they're faced with. Um, so this is a current picture of the region where I live in the Brosse Valley. There's lots of green at the moment because we've had a lot of rain, uh, which is great, but it also means a lot of vegetation. So South Australia, where the, in, in the, the Brosse Valley is um, found, produces about 51% of the grapes in Australia and processes about 50 to 60,000 tonnes in the actual region itself. Um, I live in Anguston in a small township in the Brossa Valley uh, and in the last 10 years I've had to evacuate a number of times from my house due to fires. So for us it's at constantly at the back of our minds. Um, in 2019 and 2020, which are the most recent uh, devastating bushfires across Australia, uh, we called it the Black Summer of Bushfires. We had extensive fire damage all around the country. Um, about 1,500 hectares of vines were burnt this summer, to which just 1% of the nation's vineyards, but a much bigger area uh, were affected by smoke taint. Wine tourism was gutted in many regions. Uh, this was the second very dry year and yields were significantly down. So there was, in many cases, not a lot of wine to sell. Um, so in 2020, uh, in South Australia, we had a number of fires around South Australia. In the Adelaide Hills, we had a lot of intense fires, vineyards that burnt down. In the Barossa Valley, uh, we had limited smoke exposure, um, not as much as the others, depending on location. And Kangaroo Island was devastated in many ways. Uh, the ecosystem, in many cases, uh, was desecrated. Um, the Hunter Valley, on the other hand, which is in the northern sort of regions north of Sydney, um, known for producing some iconic Semillon and Syrah, it's very humid, a much warmer climate. So in 2020, they didn't just have a fire event, they had months and months of heavy, heavy smoke uh, across the state. So... Um, I just wanted to give you a different picture, a bit of a picture of all the different regions and, or not all the different regions, some of the different regions and how they were impacted differently. So what happened then? Um, the AWI did an amazing job of putting together roadshows and communicating to the industry all the science that they've built and shown, and Mango did an amazing job of showing um, some fantastic science before. Um, and Kerry was certainly a busy, busy person at that time as well. We, we all were. Um, so there were a lot of bucket ferments. So uh, bucket ferments were a way of taking grapes and sort of having a, a sense of what was going to happen, what the ferments were going to look like. It's, it's certainly not a perfect science. There was a lot of analysis that got conducted uh, and I, I'm, I applaud Mango and the team at the AWRI because we do need those robust predictive models um, because at the end of the day, 
like Mango mentioned, there is that gray area where you get your numbers and you know, it, if it's very high, then you can you can see that quite easily. But there is a lot of grey area about what what can we do now, what do we need to do. Um, small growers can make decisions for themselves, while big corporate companies, you know, it may be the account that's deciding on the basis of numbers. So it's it's not a simple science, as um, both Mango and Kerry demonstrated. So then we got to the point after all this information, it was almost like an, an information overload. So winemakers were coming to us on the Lafort side of things and, and to many other suppliers as well. Um, and they said, so what now, what do we do? We know we've got these issues, what do we do? Um, so for me, it really came down to what levels of risk are you dealing with? Um, are you dealing with low levels? Are you dealing with medium levels or are you dealing with high levels of smoke tank? Um, so coming back to the regions of South Australia that were impacted. So, you know, we were dealing with incredibly high levels in the Adelaide Hills. Um, but, you know, it was really important to understand that you could have vineyards next to vineyards that were burnt down that were completely fine because the wind was going in the opposite direction. Um, you know, in the Brossa Valley, like I said, we had very limited smoke exposure. We, we had some that came across uh, from the Kangaroo Island fires and kind of sat on the vineyards for a day. So depending on where your vineyard was localised and what sort of where the, the wind was going really dictated what, uh, how much impact you had on your grapes. Um, and so we, we were dealing with much, much lower levels there. Uh, Kangaroo Island, we were dealing with enormously high levels in some cases. Uh, there's a pretty iconic uh, French producer there who only produced a Chardonnay and a Rosé that year. Um, so for me, it's about a risk assessment. You know, uh, what kind of variety are we dealing with? Mango did a, an, an amazing job, again, of showing, you know, the differences. It's, it's not as simple as looking at a number. You need to look at the number. You need to look at the numbers. You need to look at the variety and a whole lot of other factors and the sensory, you need to be doing the bucket ferments and assessing your risk as a whole. And, you know, whether you can get away with those compounds in something like Shiraz better than Cabernet, for, for example. Um, are we dealing with a rosé wine? Are we dealing with a red wine? Are we dealing with a white wine? And importantly, are we dealing with a super premium wine or are we dealing with a bulk wine that's under a different label? Um, what is the risk you can afford to take with your product? Um, so again, with regards to fruit expression, this is something that is really, really key. Uh, if Lafort could sell something fruit in a bottle, <laughs> it would be perfect, but unfortunately we don't have that. Um, so as Kerry so Ella, um, did a great job of talking about, so these smoke tank compounds are actually, we believed to be relatively stable post-fermentation. Um, and we should specify that aroma removing carbons are quite important in removing those, uh, sorry, I shouldn't say glycoconjugal, the vo volatile compounds, um, not so much the glycoconjugates, but they're also very, very good at removing fruit. So it's a double-edged sword. Um, as the wine ages, that fruit expression will likely drop off. And again, the smoke appears more prominent, which fits in with all the sensory work I've done over the past 10 years. Um, and the palate is often, it presents as quite bitter and acrid. Um, so what are the decision points that we can influence as winemakers? The first and most important question in my mind is to pick or not to pick. You have that choice uh, in some cases. Um, that is something that needs to be assessed if we're dealing with high levels of, uh, of taint. Um, skin contact and maceration, the use of maceration enzymes, uh, yeast and fruit expression. Um, I'll talk a little bit about this later. Pressing cycles and separating fractions. These are tools you can use. Um, finding treatment options. I mean, there are things that will help, but they, it's, they're not necessarily removing the core problem. Um, oak, I mean, 
there are oak certainly won't take away any of the smoke tainted compounds but it's something that can add to the aromatic um the aromatic profile of the wine um, and may assist you in making a more fruit driven aromatic product that you can sell um, and distillation potentially is something to look at as well uh, Kerry can do a great job of talking to you about the science there so in Australia in 2020 we did a number of a number of 10 kilo bucket trials in um, all in triplicates. We looked at a Gruner Veltner where we looked at vegetable fibers. We looked at aroma removing carbons. Uh, we looked at different types of yeast um, that had specific beta glucosidase activity. We looked at different oak options that were quite aromatic and uh, enzymes ma and maceration enzymes to see what the impacts were. We did this on many many wines that vintage um, and I'm not going to show you a whole bunch of data because I think it's more interesting to just give you a snapshot of what we saw um, that fit in with what what has been discussed uh, so maceration enzymes can certainly increase the levels of smoke tank compounds that are sensorially perceived at the end of fermentation um, depending on the enzyme you used it gave more sort of palate weight but you did see that increased perception of uh, smoke tank compounds in that particular vintage many winemakers chose to add the maceration enzymes that they had already purchased but potentially at the end of fermentation after they had pressed off their wines um, different types of carbon are very different have different properties in removing um Volatile phenols and glycoconjugates, as Kerry said, it's very hard to remove those glycoconjugates. The volatile phenols are much more easily removed with aroma removing carbons than color removing carbons. Um, and again, Virginie can can answer any questions <laughs> you have about that. Um, concept of using yeast hulls. I mean, honestly, we we saw minimal impact that it certainly helps and fills out the palate, but it's it's not going to remove the core problems. Um, pressing fractions, this is really important. Um, if you, I've seen multiple, multiple versions of um, white wines where we've looked at different pressing fractions and you certainly can't see it in the free run, but in the hard pressings, you can, you really see a very different impact, a very present impact of smoke tank. Um, so vegetable based finding agents, again, there's some improvement, but there's very little impact on the actual volatile phenols. So you might be, there are lots of things you can add to, to help make the wine slightly more acceptable, but they're not removing the core problem. Um, there is no magic solution. We don't have one. I'd love to present you with one, um, but it is such a complex science. Uh, and we, I personally was very reluctant to start giving out protocols about how to um, remediate smoke taint um, because I don't think it's, we have the full scientific understanding yet. Um, like I said, we know that geosorbent aroma removing carbon works very, very well on removing volatile phenols, but it's worth pointing out the levels that we're dealing with um, are extraordinarily high. Um, in some of those Hunter Valley wines, which were just, you felt like you were chewing on a, a, a uh, not, something not very nice, a piece of carbon. Uh, we were dealing with 3000 parts to try and sort of, and, and you take out so much of the wine in that case. Um, so any fruit you can build is a good thing in my view, um, obviously anything you can do to try and build up that fruit and, and, and fill out that wine is a good thing. But again, it's all about what sort of levels you're dealing with. Um, the concept of using beta-glucosidase enzymes is a really interesting one. Uh, it can only be used on wine as opposed to juice because the glucose is inhibitory towards that enzymatic activity. Um, but again, it will significantly increase the amount of volatile phenols, but then you're left with volatile phenols that can be removed with aroma removing carbon, but at that point you're also removing fruit. So it, it's, a, it's a balancing act. 
Um, so manoproteins, we did have some success in the Hunter Valley, but this was more about filling out the palate um, as, as both Mango and Kerry mentioned, there is quite an impact on the palate of these either glycoconjugates or um, just on the, the sensory profile of the wine. So anything you can do, these things can help, but again, they're not fixing the problem. Um, this is just some data looking at one gram per litre of geosorb on a finished wine and the impact it has on those different volatile phenols. Uh, that's the average of duplicates. Um, so this is work that uh, Wilk uh, Carey has been doing and she explained it perfectly. Uh, I won't go into it. Distillation may be a concept. Um, so then we get, get to work in, uh, in 2020, we had dramatic fires in Australia, but then the US decided to um, outshine us on that one. Well, they did it. They, <laughs> they tried. Um, and so we did many, many uh, fermentations there as well. And the, the guys over there did um, 125 micro fermentations and did many of the same things that we did in Australia, where we looked at a whole different, uh, a suite of fining agents of uh, yeast extracts, of yeast hulls, of manoproteins, of de, um, deodorizing carbon, of decolorizing carbon, casein, PVPP. And they found exactly the same. They did a enormous amounts of sensory on it um, and they found exactly the same results as us you know geosorb or aroma removing carbon was the one thing that actually removed the compounds and everything else kind of helped uh, but it didn't fix the problem so I think the take-home for me is there is no magic bullet there's no magic solution yet um, is through working with in collaboration with a number of different research organisations um, that we're really hoping to understand a lot more about the mechanism of uptake, the impact on different varieties, um, and how we can really work with um, what we have to, to improve the final wine that a winemaker can sell. So just coming back to what I started with, um, I think it, for me, it's about understanding what we're dealing with in terms of risk. If you're, if you're dealing with low levels, understand your product risk. Is it a high or a low value product? Can you make rosé and, and use a lot of fining aid, uh, use a lot of carbon in that early sort of must stage um, to minimise that risk? Can you, and if you are making a wine that is saleable post-fermentation that doesn't look, you know, that is acceptable, um, think about releasing it quite early because if that, while the fruit is still present, um, the, the work that we see does support that fruit does drop off over time and, um, and that that smoke, smoke becomes more pronounced. So medium levels and high levels, again, decision to pick or not to pick is probably your most impactful um, decision here. Um, must treatment using aroma removing carbons will help um, and minimizing your risk. Um, and, you know, distillation may be an option for you at those extremely high levels. Um, so thank you to everyone at the BioLafort team, the Lafort US team, and um, the Lafort Australia team, which I didn't put on there. <laughs> um, the University of Adelaide, we work uh, as much as we can with Kerry and Anatha. Um, and we are very grateful to the AWI for the amazing work and communications they give to the industry. Um, so that's it from me. Um, over to you, Mark. Happy to take yeah, questions. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Alana. Thank you so much. And I think lots of really good practical um, insights there about what we do. So look, I might bring the presenters back on now so that they've got their, everyone's back on in terms of their cameras and they've got their, they're ready to take some questions here. Now, I did note in the Q&A, Agatha, that there was uh, a question there from some, someone in Serbia, Darko, that has since disappeared. So I'm not sure whether that was a question for Carlo. Did you see that question, Carlo? Yeah, I said that I was going to answer it live. So he's now yep. in the answered uh, list, so to speak. No worries. Okay, over to you. 
Yeah, so the question was about uh, the uh, uh, summer of extreme that we have just experienced in Europe and, um, and uh, um, you know, what is the cause of it or what are our comments? So this indeed was a quite extraordinary summer, as I mentioned in the presentation. Um, and uh, unfortunately, it doesn't come necessarily as a surprise. So we do expect a uh, heat wave uh, to become more frequent. So the heat wave in this case um, was very long or was a sequence, a very long sequence of heat waves started back in May and continued till, well, in, in a sense, till very, very recently, because we are uh, in October. Uh, we had the warmest October on record, and now the beginning of November doesn't seem to really make a transition into a wintry climate. So um, quite extraordinary, but not. And uh, uh, not unexpected, entirely unexpected. So, if you look at the climate projections that were produced maybe 20 years ago about what the temperature was going to be like uh, at this time in, in the century, that if anything, were a bit overcautious. So, uh, but this summer was in in in, in the broad sense um, in in line with our previous expectation, which. Uh, sounds a, a bit of an alarm bell because um, the projection for the future called for this kind of summer to become more common. So this has been a very warm summer, but it would be probably considered a cool summer by the 2050s. So maybe thank, thank you. Thank you, Carlo. That, that was really interesting. Listen, a question, uh, there's, there's more coming through here now, just which is great. Um, I'm just making sure in terms of, yeah, okay. Question for you, Carla, just as well. I'll keep going and I'll, I'll, I'll step through the presenters to make sure I've got them here. But through your European Centre for Medium Range Weather Forecasts and your, your specific centre, Carla, do you have good information about smoke plume modelling that you, that at a resolution that could be quite useful to understand where smoke is moving across the landscape in, in the European context? Well, it depends on the resolution <laughs> you need that, but um, you know some of these animations I was showing before really pick up uh, the signature in uh, uh, the smoke signature from the fire, and you see the evolution. I was showing the one coming from uh, well, that, that was CO rather than than uh, than uh, particle matter, but it, you you can you can use either to see the evolution over time. I was showing the the plume coming from. Uh, California all the way all the way to Europe. So this uh, uh, this modeling and this monitoring exists and can be used uh, openly. So that that that's in in a sense uh, is is a good news because you can um, you can get that information. Is not um, is is I don't know. It depends on on the application, but it's of the order of uh, ten kilometers. So that that's the resolution we are talking uh, at least for Europe um, and and is coming with a few hours delay. But, um, so this is the constraint we have, but the technology exists. Yeah, no, fantastic. Um, I might throw to Mango, I've, I've got some practical questions popping up on the screen, but I actually might just ask you a question around um, early season smoke exposure. I think it's probably important. So at what stage of grapevine development are we seeing you know, that, that's really open to the risk of smoke uptake by the grapevine? Yeah, I guess that was a big learning from the 2019-2020 season in Australia because we had bushfires starting a lot earlier than they have historically happened around the country. Um, and the bad news was that we saw the smoke uptake and resulting in smoke-tainted wines, really quite highly smoke-flavoured wines, even at a very early stage, um, well before Verazon, I think it was, um, yeah, like small pepper green, peppercorn green, small berries um, were some of those examples where, where a, a just a short, intense smoke event at such an early stage had a devastating effect. So our advice now is really any time that there is a grape formed, so straight after fruit set, um, right through to harvest, any time smoke enters the vineyard during that entire ripening period, there is a risk there. 
Um, we haven't seen any examples of smoke taint from flowering or before that time, but I guess we can't rule that out. Thanks, Mango. I'm going to go to some of the questions on the screen and probably just open it up to the presenters to help answer here. So I'll start off with uh, my friend in Portugal, Carlos Lopez. Um, is there any viticultural practices to minimise the risk of smoke taint? So open that up to, um, again, the panellists here. So Kerry, do you want to open up with that one, perhaps? Sure. Um, so I can tell you we've tried a number of different things in a vineyard. Um, spraying grapes with water, even if you're spraying the grapes with water while they're being exposed to smoke, doesn't work. The smoke compounds just get into the grapes too quickly. Um, we've looked at defoliation um, and whilst defoliation post smoke exposure had a small impact, it's by no means the silver bullet and probably the, the cost of labour and whether you could even get into a vineyard to, to do that if there's a fire nearby, um, it's, it's certainly not a solution. Um, where we've seen some promise has been a number of protective sprays, so things that apply um, like a physical barrier to the grapes that stop the smoke getting um, into the berry. The challenge with that is making sure that you get good coverage of the fruit so you don't have some grapes or some bunches that aren't being protected. Um, so that's a bit of a challenge. And then all different foliar sprays are not the same. So there are some that actually exacerbate the uptake of smoke exposure, so things like anti-transparents. Um, we've had a bit of success with kaolin, but it's mixed. Where we can get it to stick, it seems to work reasonably well, but getting it to stick on all varieties has been problematic. Um, at the moment for us, um, we're looking at an activated carbon fabric, which we've done some preliminary work that shows that it prevents the smoke compounds getting into the grapes because it's essentially being absorbed by the fabric itself. We just need to get that to something that's practical for use in a vineyard because at the moment, the idea of putting a bag on every bunch of grapes in a vineyard is not feasible. Um, and there are a few shortcomings with the, the material. But I think in terms of stopping smoke taint, um, ideally a, a mitigation strategy in the vineyard <coughs> would be the, the best way to go. And there are another, a number of other research groups um, around the world that are looking at this sort of, of um, um, viticultural practice to try and mitigate smoke taint before it occurs. Thanks, Kerry. Um, I, I think Kerry might pay just to just tease this out a little bit because I'm really understanding how smoke gets into the grapes uh, and how it's uh, metabolised pretty quickly, I think is quite important in, in really understanding this problem too. And I think, you know, a lot of the work you've done there around looking at uh, detached grapes versus attached grapes and that sort of stuff. I think there's some pretty important learnings here about really understanding some of the mechanisms that around smoke uptake. Do you want to share some of those, Kerry? Yeah, I guess we can say that we've done both um, on vine and, and off vine or post harvest smoke exposure um, and have shown that even post harvest smoke exposure, um, these compounds are still getting into the grapes and the grapes are still glycosylating them. And in, in fact, there's some work out of uni British Columbia that they've used table grapes and um, post harvest smoke exposure and the grapes are still glycosylating with volatile phenols. So th that's why with your diagnostics, you, you need to be looking at both volatiles and glycoconjugates. Um, and we've shown in some of our research that Within an hour of smoke exposure, we can see elevated levels of volatile phenols. At 24 hours, we've maybe seen metabolism of 80% of what we were seeing at one hour. Um, and then in some instances, we're seeing a delay in the accumulation of the glycoconjugates. So um, we might see glycoconjugates forming even as early as one hour and 24 hours, but then the levels that we see one week post smoke exposure and through to harvest are much higher. And we sort of look at it going, well, hang on, where are the volatile phenols? So maybe it's an extractability thing that the way we're extracting them, we're not being able to pull out the conjugated versions, but it's just something to be aware of. And that, that's something we don't quite have a, a handle on yet. Thanks, Kerry. Yeah, really thorough. Um, listen, there's another question online here. So I'll just read it out verbatim. Uh, based on observation that smoke tank may return, will winemakers change their recommendations on ageing, uh, cellaring of their wines? 
yes, <laughs> drink as quickly as possible. Don't mm -hmm. you don't want to be cellaring smoke tainted wines? I, I think they're not they're not likely to get any better. Oh, yeah. yeah, concur. No, no problems. Um, this this question is probably just a mixture of perhaps mango and, and Alana too. I think it's really important to run through what the best management practice approach would be in terms of, you know, what happens if, you know, obviously smoke hits the vineyard, what's the approach that we're, we're, we're recommending at the moment? And Alana, you, you went into some detail here, but I think it's important just to tease it out about, you know, what to do if your vineyard is, is affected by smoke. What are those those steps that you go through about deciding when, how to, if to pick or not to pick, et cetera, et cetera. Do you want to just step through that again? Because I think this is actually quite an important thing um, because you know, we want to make these decisions in a commercial setting, usually when everything else is going on all at the same time, right? Absolutely. Um, and it was, I think, so firstly, there's, if you have a smoke event, um, some practical understanding about, you know, what, where the weather, what, what was happening with the weather at that time, how close you were, how many hours it was exposed to, um, how much sort of smoke exposure we're talking. Um, I think, you know, many winemakers would take samples of grapes as close as they could to, um, to picking, to harvest, because that gave them the best interpretation of uh, what the wines would look like and they would do that say two weeks before harvest they would take you know a bucket's worth of grapes from the vineyard they would um, squash the grapes they would put some yeast in there and they would conduct mini fermentations um, and at that point you can take it to excel labs and they can they can do some uh, they can do the analysis for you uh, but at that point I think one of the most critical things is actually just to look at it and smell it and taste it. And if you can smell and taste smoke, then that's a good indication of what your wine is going to look like. It's not perfect. Um, and even the numbers, even I have seen examples of winemakers who have gotten the numbers, um, they've done the bucket ferments, they're happy. And then the resulting wine, you know, they're picking it two weeks later. It, it does come up with smoke. So I think be prepared to do bucket ferments, get analysis uh, and, and really understand what the risk is to your brand of making a wine that is potentially um, not the qualitative outcome you would like. Yeah, no, thanks, Alana. Mango, I'm going to flick to you and just have a talk a bit about, I mean, sensory evaluation of smoke tainted wines and some of the learnings that have really popped up from the team at AWRI over the last probably couple of years in terms of just how to make sure that we're not getting uh, too many false positives, et cetera, et cetera, in, the, in that evaluation. Do you want to just outline some of the learnings that have come out of the sensory team um, over the last couple of years? Yeah, thanks, Mark. I realised that I didn't really talk about this in my presentation and maybe I should have, that... Um, what we see with the smoke compounds, both the volatile phenols and the glycosides, is that not everybody has the same threshold or the same sensitivity to those compounds. So when you're assessing smoke tainted wines, it's really important to know that you're using a panel or that you're using people who you know are quite sensitive to those compounds. Um, that's one aspect. So that you know that you're not missing it but on the other hand if you go into a tasting and you're looking for smoke characters it's very easy to be influenced by your expectation bias so we recommend that the tastings should be done in uh, as rigorous a way as possible and definitely including clean control wines because that way you have an idea of how the particular panelist is performing for that task on the day. If they are rating the clean control wines as highly smoky, then that's a red flag that that person is not performing well on that particular day. And we all have good days and bad days, but it's good to be aware that there are these challenges that we all face when we're evaluating wines in a situation like this. And we want to make sure that it's a really true result 
because you don't want to miss out on producing a wine and potentially uh, those grapes going to waste that could have been okay because you had a, a false positive result with your sensory. And on the other hand, you don't want to um, go ahead and make a wine that turns out to be unacceptably smoky and carries a lot of investment to get it through to that point. Um, and then to have to downgrade the wine quality at the end. So yeah, it's very important. There's some very nice resources that our teams developed about how you can go about, how winemakers can go about doing, putting a little bit more rigor into their sensory evaluations to give them a lot more confidence that they are picking up a true result. Um, Mango, is there any information on, um, in, in the teams I've always worked with, we've found that the, the saturation, like the saturation of smoke taint in your, at least on my palate and a lot of palates is quite quick. Um, so you really do need to take time in between wines and, and drink water just to make sure you're not completely saturating your palate. Yeah, that's a really good point. I, I should have mentioned that. Um, there's even greater variation in the sensitivity to the glycosides. And for some people, they can taste the glycosides on almost an equimolar concentration to the free volatile phenols. So they can taste very low concentrations, but other people can't seem to really taste them much at all. So for the people who are sensitive, um, that flavor can develop and really build over a couple of minutes. So when we're doing our assessments here at AWRI, we have force rests of up to two minutes in between samples and washing with water and other groups have developed um, other protocols as well with different types of wash solutions that can speed that up a little bit. But it is really important to take the time to allow the flavours to develop and then to clear your palate properly before tasting the next sample. Yeah, thanks, Mago. Listen, we've got time for one more question. Because, uh, Pierre-Louis, I just want to leave a little bit of time here towards the end for, for some summing up. But look, I think there's, a, there's an interesting question here around if a winemaker decides not to harvest grapes for wine production due to the high risk of smoke tank, what can be done with these grapes? Can they be used for some other purpose? So, and I think um, I'm, I'm going to sort of maybe direct this back towards perhaps Kerry, because I mean, you, you've been really looking at, you know, distillation and other options here as well. But Kerry, can, can you just provide some, some options? It's pretty tough, um, but yeah, there are some thoughts here. Yeah, I pulled the slides on from my deck on, on distillation, because I was worried I was going to be over time and I was. Um, we have done a trial um, and in collaboration with Alana um, looking at distillation and it's it's quite promising. Um, so in a, um, an initial batch distillation, the stillage, so what remains following distillation, um, retains all of the, the glycoconjugate, the, the glycoconjugates because they're obviously not volatile. So you can produce a low wine that still has volatile phenols, but we've now separated out the, the glycoconjugate component. We've then done fractional distillation on, on that, and we can also do a, a carbon treatment on it prior to fractional distillation. We're able to isolate fractions that we can then take through, um, and they have far lower levels of volatile phenols and, and you know, could then be used for, for spirit production. Um, and even if you've got a little bit of a smoky character there, it could potentially be masked through the use of botanicals, for example, if you're gonna make something like gin. Um, we have another project ongoing, a PhD project um, with a student who's looking at making brandy, so taking smoke tainted wines and distilling them and then aging them in, um, in oak barrels. Um, so this work looks like it's, it's quite promising. Um, whether there's enough demand for that volume of, of spirit, um, and gin's pretty popular in Australia at the moment, so maybe. Um, we might also have plenty of non-smoke tainted wine that could be diverted to, to spirit production, but it, at least it is an alternative that can be used to recover something that it, at least gives you a, a saleable product um, rather than having a, a smoke tainted wine. Um, a lot of 
a lot of people did choose to make rosé out of red grapes that year um, just because there's very limited skin contact and they could get some kind of saleable product out of it that they could find extremely heavily in the, in the must stage. Um, it's not a perfect solution, but it, it might be something that gets you a product. Yeah, thank you. Listen, there's one very final question here, just I want to make sure we've addressed all the questions online. How can the consumer know to drink now? Will winemakers mark the labels? And that's not been the case, certainly in Australia, that we've done this. I mean, what tends to happen in those particular situations is uh, a, a, a certain wine estate might not put that into their estate label, but they'll actually create probably a probably an inferior label that they can move quite quickly and try and sell at a lower price. Uh, so that it moves in the market a bit quicker. So I just so I wanted to make sure that I'd address that question too. But listen, our, our time's coming to the end. I just want to um, I just want to thank our presenters. So Carlo, thank you very much for your insights there. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, Mango, Kerry, and Alana. Um, I, I know the Australian accent's probably been running hot, hard here on online. I hope you've understood us in uh, in Europe. Um, but please, uh, if there are any further questions, I just wanted to really point to point you towards the AWRI website, so www.awri.com.au. And if you follow the link through winemaking, there's a link there to Smoke Tank with an amazing array of free resources there for, for industry members around, you know, a lot of information around Smoke Tank. It's been distilled over many years, and I encourage the producers online to, to go to those. Uh, if you've got any questions, we're happy to take them afterwards through Pierre Louis and, and, and other means as well. So, Pierre Louis, I might um, wrap it up from my end there and hand it back to you, perhaps to just close out this mini symposium, please. Thank you, Mark. Thank you to all of you. Uh, I am very happy uh, that we had time to, to see uh, all the different uh, aspects concerning the, the smoke taint and how to try to solve how to learn uh, and how to, to fight against this trouble. Uh, I hope in the future, uh, especially for the first presenter, uh, Mr. Buentampo, uh, that was, it was also very interesting that we are able to have a, a sensor network, able to, to have probably some uh, fire markers or smoke mic markers uh, to, to, to try to help uh, and to the food, but maybe also uh, the water and other uh, uh, grapes, of course, but also uh, other type of foods that we are using currently. Uh, so I want to thank uh, uh, Mark for uh, his extensive work to, for the preparation, but also, of course, all the, the presenters. So Carlo, uh, Mango, uh, Kerry, and Alana. Uh, it was very nice to learn from you. I want also to thank uh, of the people that were involved and uh, attending the meeting. And so, of course, if you need more information, as Mark was telling you, feel free to contact us. You know that we have a website also on NOVT. The meeting has been recorded, so you can uh, have access uh, to, to the link of the, of the event. Um, and so uh, I wish to all of you uh, all the best for the, the end of the day and uh, for the future and see you for our next event of the network. Thank you very much.